hope that helped bring to life uh, this issue. Uh, as I mentioned, it is one of the biggest problems facing our country. And so many issues that we face seem intractable. Um, but there is a potential solution for financial inclusion uh, that's rooted in technology. And we're going to have a conversation uh, around some of the things that are being done around this. There's no silver bullet. Uh, there's no one company. There's no one organization that can solve financial inclusion. It's got to be a partnership between the public and the private sectors, between nonprofits, startups, our government, uh, some of the regulations. And if you go to spentmovie.com, there are things small and larger uh, to, uh, to begin to think about this and how each of us might get involved. We released Spent on YouTube uh, a couple of weeks ago, and over 12 million people have viewed the documentary already. Um, and so we are getting a tremendous reception. The day we released it, the next day, you had three senators put out press releases. I'm proud to say you had them both on the right and on the left, uh, because financial inclusion isn't a red or a blue issue. It really is a red, white, and blue issue. It spans across uh, the aisles here. So I think we're going to start uh, with this. and. Uh, we really encourage you to be a part of this overall conversation. So thank you. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, can you guys hear me? You can? Great. Um, this is my second time seeing the movie. I, I just think it's, it's a sensational piece of journalism, I think. I mean, these are complex, complex issues. And to make it this deeply human, I thought, was just really impressive. Um, one of the things that struck me, um, I'm Derek Thompson. I'm a, a senior editor at The Atlantic Magazine. I write about business and economics. Um, and one of the big themes about business and economics is that the U.S. government, in terms of its philosophy of economics, is generally progressive. We tax rich people more than we tax poor people. We have programs like Medicaid that protect poor people. We have programs like Earn Income Tax Credit. The idea of U.S. economic policy is that we should use our wealth to make life easier for the poor. And then you look at an issue like this, about the 70 million unbanked Americans. And let's just think about that number, 70 million. That's more than the combined populations of California, New York, and Maryland. It's more people than voted for Mitt Romney in 2012. And it's more people than voted for Barack Obama in 2012, speaking of this being a red, white, and blue issue. Um, and you see very, very clearly, and again, in a very human way, that it is more expensive to be poor than it is to have means, to have means that qualify you for a banking account. And there's just a sort of American sense that it shouldn't be that way. Um, I'm joined uh, by, by, by Dan from American Express, and I also want to introduce uh, Bill Bynum. He's CEO of uh, Hope Enterprise Corporation. Um, and Bill, my first question is for you. One of the one of the stories that I think, or the lessons that hit me most cogently from this is that people can do everything right and still find themselves in this situation. Sure. I was really moved by the woman in the movie with the 401k plan with $100,000, an associate's degree, a bachelor degree, an MBA. Mm -hmm. She has done every single thing a life coach at Aspen would tell her to do. But a quirk of fate has put her in this situation. And it reminded me of something you were saying earlier today um, about a woman from Mississippi. Uh, who also did everything right and found herself uh, needing, uh, in need. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that woman's story and, and how it connects to what Hope is trying sure. to do? Sure, sure. Thanks, Derek. It's, it's really amazing how many of the members that we serve at my credit union who reminded me, who remind me of the people that we saw in this movie. Um, if... Um, if you just change the names, I, I, could, I could tell you uh, about people like Gloria, um, who is one of our members. She had a job, good paying job, um, but she needed a car to go to work and she had a car, but one day her car broke down. She needed $300 to repay it. Uh, she didn't have $300. She went to a payday lender, got $300, um, fixed her car, kept working, but when payday came, uh, when, when the time came to pay the check, um, pay the loan, 
she didn't have the cash because she had bills. She, um, and so she went and got another payday loan and another payday loan and another payday loan. And before you knew it, she owed $2,700 um, due on the same day. Um, this is perfectly legal um, for her to go to eight payday lenders and get different loans. But it's clear that her $1,300 every two weeks that she earned would not pay that $2,700 loan. Um, and so we fortunately were able to um, restructure the loan, term it out as an installment loan. She kept the car and she was able to um, get back, starting to get back on her feet. Um, the, um, you know, if I wasn't here this week, I would be back home in Mississippi. Uh, many of you know that this is the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer, where people from all across the country came into our region to fight for the right to vote. Uh, and fortunately, we, Mississippi's a great place. Uh, I've raised my f uh, daughter there, um, um, great friends, but it's still a, one of the most impoverished places in the country. And the data that you saw about the proliferation of petty lenders at a time when banks are abandoning the communities in record levels, um, Mississippi in the Mid-South, across the Deep South is ground zero uh, for that. So we're seeing that every day. Um, and it's really a tragedy that those who are most vulnerable have to pay the highest cost for basic, um, ba basic small dollar loans. Petty lenders promote themselves as a safety net, as a short-term solution to a problem, but it's a business model that relies on people coming back over and over and over. The average payday uh, loan recipients, uh, recipients renews that loan 10 times. That is not, that is not a short-term small dollar loan. Um, the, um, there are some states that have outlawed it. Colorado has done a great job. They only, they, they require installment loans uh, that term them out and take into consideration a borrower's ability to pay. But most states have not followed that suit and the uh, federal government does not have uh, authority to set interest rates. So it, it's, it's a major problem and it doesn't just exist though in the deep south and in poor communities. One of the things I really want to applaud American Express for doing is to showing this film and that, that breaks away, I think, some of the stereotypes um, that we think about when we uh, think of who gets payday loans. Everyone in this room knows somebody like the people who were in that film. Um, they could be family members, friends, um, but when you think about who is hurt and hit the most, the hardest by payday lenders, it's low income families. Uh, when you think about the issues, illness, um, uh, temporary loss of job, uh, life circumstances that affected the people in this film, they affect low-income people many, many times over in much more severe ways. And they don't have, unfortunately, um, this, they may not have friends who can uh, step in and pay the loan once they get into the hole. And so it's, it's a serious problem and it's getting, it's getting worse as you see financial gaps get wider. I'd say, just to, Please, just to yeah, add on that ahead. very quickly, yeah, I used to think of this as a, a lower income issue exclusively, and, and I now think of it as sort of the new middle class, right? This is, I, I just saw a study, the, the old study was 50% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. The latest study that came out is maybe as many as 60% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. They just don't have the buffer uh, to handle life shocks. Most of us handle life shocks either through savings or through uh, credit. Um, that's how we get by. But uh, the overwhelming majority of our population doesn't have that luxury today. Dan, I want to follow up. There are so many statistics here, in addition to the human stories, that just made me shocked and outraged. The $89 billion in unnecessary fees, just a staggering, staggering figure. The 10% the, the that they're paying in unnecessary fees equaling what co common American households spend on food. I'm interested because in your work on this, and in the experiment that you did with some people at American Express, where you literally walked in the shoes of unbanked people and tried to see, okay, what is it like to live days without a banking system yeah. when I have to turn a paycheck into cash to, in order to pay bills. Throughout this entire process, what fact or finding has surprised you the most or, or maybe stuck with you the most that, that's sort of hardest to shake off? 
Yeah. I think um, most people can kind of, um, you can get, I guess, in your brain, it's hard to get in your heart, uh, the fees that people uh, pay. So when I walked uh, and, and did all this, it's hard to imagine how inconvenient it is to manage and move money when you don't have the traditional things that we have. Um, I mean, really, you know, managing and moving your money should be a right, not really a privilege. And what happens is if you don't have a bank account, and as Bill mentioned, there are thousands of branches that close every year. There are branches that open, by the way, but the places where branches are closed, 93% of those bank branches are in communities where the average income is below the national average. A bank needs at least $30 million in deposits to be profitable. Um, and so I've seen studies where the bottom 40% of bank customers are unprofitable. So what do they do for the past 17 years in a row? Banks have raised fees. There really isn't a free checking account anymore. The average checking account. What sort of fees? So the average checking account. So checking accounts now cost $5.78. And that's gone up by almost double digits every single year. The minimum amount for a checking, for free checking, right, is now $750. You know, as we talked about, 50% of Americans couldn't even raise $2,000 in 30 days if they had an emergency. So they certainly don't have $750 sitting around. Um, if you've ever checked your uh, terms and conditions on a checking account, I'm sure many of you have done that here. Um, uh, it's uh, 111 pages uh, is the average terms and conditions. By the way, for those of you who are thinking, how do I compare that? That's two times the length of Romeo and Juliet. Um, and the only thing I can see in common is they're both tragedies uh, in many ways. Um, but you had, as I mentioned, Americans spending $30 billion in overdraft fees, $30 billion. So what shocked me the most, um, and not that I encourage people to go do this, but if you live in somebody's shoes for a while, you, you feel that pain is the amount of time it takes to stand in line for 30 to 45 minutes just to cash a check. And then when you cash that check, they take two to 4% of that check to give you cash. And then, as they said in the film, you just have cash. There's really not a lot you can do with cash. You can't pay your bills with cash, so you've got to go to another location, wait in line for another 30 to 45 minutes and get a money order. That money order for a typical cable bill that costs like $50 can cost $11 just to get the money order. So not only are you waiting in line, but every place that you try and change currency from one form to another costs you a tremendous amount of money. And it was just, it was shocking to me how inconvenient it was. I went to one cash checker uh, location and the check to me was made out to Dan Shulman. My driver's license says Daniel Shulman on it. And they said, well, we can't cash this check because it's not made out. And I said, come on, I mean, that's my name. It's my picture on there. It's obviously me. And they said, well, we can't do it, but if you go down the block, up the stairs to an apartment on the sixth floor, they do cash that uh, for you, but it'll cost you like 12% of your check to go do that. And I was like, oh, never mind, I'm not gonna go up to some weird apartment in the middle <laughs> of who knows where to go do it. But it's just the sort of the, the, the time, the productivity. It's a part-time job. Like it is said. a part-time right. job, and right. I don't think mm -hmm. people realize that on top of the fees, it's just hard to be a productive citizen when you don't have access to everyday services that, again, we all take for granted. Right. Bill, the, the credit scores that determine whether people can qualify for loans, like a mortgage, it's a formula. And some people don't have elements of that formula. In the movie, someone said, I thought I was being responsible not having a credit card. Uh, the student who uh, had a, a um, Went, went to school, got all of these loans in order to go to school because having a BA tends to set you up uh, for a good career, yet, yet also had all these student loans that also worked against her. Uh, you were describing earlier today ways that hope tries to 
take into consideration other um, ways that people might be able to pay off their loan and, and find ways to, to, to get them um, uh, some, of these, some of this credit. So maybe talk a bit about that. Sure, um, Dan made a point that it is expensive um, for banks to provide some of these services, but I, I don't think it's as expensive as they often um, um, report that it is. It's a, also a matter of will. Uh, who do you see as valuable customers? Um, we are in a country that's becoming more diverse, and unfortunately, we're also seeing widening income and wealth gaps. But when banks leave these low-income um, communities, it's not that all of a sudden people stop needing um, car loans. They, they don't stop needing mortgage loans. They don't stop needing uh, resources to support their families. Um, but it doesn't... Um, it doesn't meet the metrics. It doesn't fit into the box that banks have drawn um, for the uh, profitable branch. And so in our region, we've seen branches close in record numbers. Um, but we've been able to go into those communities in many cases. And um, our model is a credit union. And we are, um, but we are regulated. We have examiners coming in, looking over our shoulders every day. We are stewards of other people's money. So we have to take care of it um, as much as a bank does. But we made a decision that these people in these low-income communities, in these bank deserts, uh, deserve access to financial services just as much as anyone. And so we've gone in, we've organized financial institutions that instead of being um, owned by shareholders in some remote place, the individuals in those communities are the shareholders. They are the uh, owners of the credit union, and they inform us about how, um, what their needs are. And obviously we cannot make every loan cannot fulfill every request but instead of saying no we say here are the issues and here's what you need to do to resolve those issues um, many of you remember old community banks um, uh, it's a wonderful life you know you go into the bank and you sit down with a loan officer and that loan officer tells you uh, what you need to do to be able to access credit we will instead of looking so um, solely at a credit score, we'll look at the borrower's track record. Have you paid bills? We'll, we'll, instead of, if they don't have, and many people have, 37% of our members never had a banking account before joining Hope. And so they may not have a credit, uh, a credit score. And so we look at if they pay their utility bills. Have you paid, what is your rent, bringing your rent stubs. Um, we create a credit record for them. And we get to a point where we can get comfortable making financial decisions that are prudent and that don't put our um, depositors' monies at risk. That's right. This is, what he's talking about in a way is innovation within the banking system in order to, you know, re reconstructing the formula for making credit. Some of the things that you're focused on is innovation outside the banking system, saying we can't necessarily rely on the banks that exist to rebank these individuals, so we need to find ways to service them outside of that system. So maybe talk a little bit about some of the solutions that were previewed toward the end of the movie. Yeah. So I think, first of all, you know, a vast majority of Americans, their goals are very different than maybe some of the goals that uh, many of us in the room have. Their goals are avoid debt, spend wisely, save for the future. And they have a hard time doing that, but that's kind of what their, what their goals are in many places. And things like um, getting credit are, are important elements sometimes, but many Americans don't necessarily want to fall into debt. And we need to think of different ways to make sure that that doesn't happen. But um, I think um, in general, we are entering into a new era. Um, and I call it sort of the era of the non-bank. Um, and I think Bill and I have had this conversation about how do you combine technology and maybe the personal touch, but you can now do all of the things that you used to be able to do in a bank branch in, with the power of, in the power of your own hand. Um, lower income and middle income uh, populations are more cell phone penetrated than upper income because, and, and by the way, have a higher percentage of smartphones because it is the single device that they use to access the internet. So they don't have laptops or you know iPads or that kind of thing. They have one device. That's what they can afford. It's a smartphone. Um, and with that smartphone, if you can think about software, and software is redefining one industry after another. 
And banking is ripe for disruption uh, right now. Um, this is not about banking the unbanked. I really don't believe that's the solution because bricks and mortar infrastructure, the, you know, the heavy costs of a bank branch, as well as tellers inside that bank, make it unprofitable in many cases for banks to uh, serve these customers. And so, you know, Bill's trying to figure out low cost ways of serving some of these customers, but how do you do something at scale? How can you reimagine the system? Think about it. You know, it's easy enough for somebody to pay, take their paycheck and automatically deposit it on a software platform, right? And, and do that free of charge, right? It's just called direct deposit. Anyone can do that. And so instead of getting 2 to 4% of your paycheck taken away, have that done free of charge directly onto a software platform. If you have a check, take a picture of that check with your cell phone. Many banks are starting to do that. Or if you don't have a smartphone, mail in that check. If you have cash, right? Because many times you go to a bank branch and you give cash to a teller to put onto your savings account or your checking account to pay your bills. Why not rethink about where you can give cash? What? We're really now working with like a whole host of retailers from Walmart to CVS to Safeway to 7-Eleven where the cashiers are becoming in effect the equivalent of tellers. You give them cash, they swipe a card and automatically that cash free of charge goes onto your digital account. And from that digital account, instead of doing money orders to pay bills, you just electronically pay them, automatically, free of charge. So everywhere where currency used to cost you money and time, you can now do free of charge. Imagine, like my daughter uh, goes to school up in Boston. I, when I was doing this experiment uh, on the streets of New York, it, I, first of all, I had to stand in line in Western Union, then I had to pay $15 just to send her $25, and then she had to stand in line to accept that money and give a password, which of course she forgot, then I had to redo it again, and then you know it just was incredibly painful. With software platforms, you can transfer money from one person to another person automatically, instantaneously. I can, while Bill's talking, I could send money to my daughter free of charge. She gets it right away, right on her software platform. She has a card associated with it. She can take it off at ATMs for free, she can spend anywhere on that free of charge. And when you do things with software, you can do them at a fraction of the cost, a fraction of the cost of bank branch bricks and mortar infrastructure. Um, you heard in the movie that somebody spends $40,000 in their lifetime on check cashing and another 30,000 on transaction charges. We've been talking about you need buffer, right, to get these life shocks. What if we could return half of that money to consumers by doing this in a more cost-efficient way with software, with mobile phones, reimagining the system? And I think that's actually a goal that we should aspire to. It is possible to go do it. It's not easy to go do it, um, but at the end of the day, like when I think about what we as a financial institution ought to be focused on, that's what we should be focused on. How do we turn half of that back to consumers? Because that would make a big difference. Derek, Go ahead. We, we are actually doing that, uh, but we're doing it on a bank platform. Uh, I, I believe strongly that at some point you need, you want individuals to be in a position to become bankable. You want them to be able to um, buy a car. You can't buy a car on a uh, prepaid um, on a prepaid card. Uh, you cannot buy a home on a prepaid card. That is still the primary assets that Americans own. It's a it's a it's a tool that you can use to uh, leverage capital to start a small business to send your kids to school. Uh, and so I think ultimately we want to be we want people to be in a position where they can participate fully in the economic system. Uh, and as the country becomes more diverse, it's even more important that we not that we equip people to, uh, to function effectively and to climb the economic ladder. Uh, unfortunately, um, 
across the country, as, as the film pointed out, there are large segments of the population who are outside the financial system. In Arkansas, 70% of African Americans, seven out of 10, uh, are either unbanked or underbanked. If they're underbanked, then they're dependent on these payday lenders and high cost uh, sources of capital. Uh, that is not sustainable. Uh, we've got to find solutions to get those folks out of those um, uh, predatory situations. We are, um, smartphones are not just smartphones, but they're smartphones. And what I mean by that is that uh, uh, low income people aren't dumb. They make decisions that make the most efficient uses of the limited resources that they have. And smartphones, you, they can't afford um, computers, the cost of um, connections, um, is, um, set internet connections at home is, is prohibitive. And so they do it all on their smartphones. But because they're on bank, they're not using it now for uh, banking services. So we've gone all in um, using mobile to reach places like Alligator, Mississippi, like um, you know, the heart of the uh, Arkansas Delta where you don't have the scale to justify the bricks and mortar and the personnel for a traditional bank branch. And so we're, we're using smartphones to reach them. And, and th there's a gap that has to be closed to get people comfortable to trust um, uh, seeing their money, uh, taking a picture of their check and believing that it's actually gonna wind up in an account that they can access. But with smartphones and debit cards, uh, people can do everything that they need to do. We're, we're investing in kiosks. Uh, self-service um, machines that allow people to conduct their transactions in an efficient way. We've partnered with a historically black college in the heart of, in Pine Bluff, um, Arkansas, University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, where the students actually staff the branch. They do outreach, let people in the community know about the services that we offer at Hope. And then the individuals come in and they can uh, sign up online um, They in, in a self-service branch. They can access their account if they don't have a computer. They can do that in the branch. Uh, they can make deposits um, at the branch um, through the ATM. And it's a much more efficient way to serve a very uh, underserved population. The, uh, the, the staff at the university are disproportionately underbanked. The alumni uh, are disproportionately unbanked. And, and if you think about the institutions across the South, colleges, community colleges, churches, all of those are where low income people uh, interact quite a bit. We have uh, a micro branch in a grocery store in Jackson. We have a micro branch in the first African American owned um, grocery store in New Orleans. Circle Food uh, was underwater during Katrina, it just reopened. We financed the reopening of that store to bring healthy food into a food desert but it also brings financial services into a bank desert. It's a kiosk, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's one of our most active branches now. So in addition to doing the things I talked about earlier, um, being innovative about creating credit scores, as the film talked about pooling resources, that's what we do in credit unions. We pool, and if you don't have a neighbor that you know, you have other people who have chosen to pool their funds into a credit union, then we use those to make loans to, um, to, to, to um, low-income um, borrowers. So there, you have to be innovative. We've got to be bold in solving these problems. I wish that we had all the answers ourselves, but through these partnerships with churches, with nonprofits, with community colleges, um, with American Express, I think the solutions are out there. Um, we also have to push the policy, the policy solutions as Actually, well. Actually, this is my last question for you, and um, we have a little bit of time for Q&A, so start teeing those up as I, as I ask this. I was going to say quickly, you made just a great point about uh, how much smartphones can save money. The other scarce resource is time. There was so much footage in this of cameras behind uh, the, the windshield wiper because they were spending so much time in cars going from place to place just to do things that for banked people are, are completely seamless. Um, and a smartphone is always is on your leg, and so it's banking that you can do without a car, um, or at least some banking you can do without a car. My last question for you is actually the last question that we got in a previous session. This is the second time we've sort of been on a panel together um, in the last 12 hours. Um, the last question was a guy who stood up in the audience and he said, Bill, I think that, that you, what you and Hope are doing is just the Lord's work, and I just want to know how we can possibly scale this. What do you need in order to scale it? And I'm, I want to tee that up so you can share your answer with the audience here today. 
Uh, I appreciate him saying that. Actually, the Pope said uh, recently that we've got to inject ethics back into the financial sector and, and, and markets have to serve the common good. I think he made an excellent point. And so I don't know if I'm doing the Lord's work, but I, I, I certainly feel like we're heading in the right direction. But we believe that we have a sustainable um, solution to transform financial services in these communities. We're growing. Uh, we have a campaign now to raise $20 million. We're halfway there. Now, but in there, there's not a great deal of wealth in the mid south, and so we're uh, recruiting capital from outside of our region, and we're making the case that even in the Bay Area, I was in San Francisco before I uh, came to Aspen this week, talking to some friends who are interested in what we do. Um, in the Bay Area, there are bank deserts. There are bank deserts in Chicago, in Boston, across the country, and the solutions that we're forging in the mid south are applicable and can help solve problems in those communities. So uh, uh, we need capital. That's one thing we need. Uh, we need a uh, smarter policy that doesn't let individuals get preyed upon the way um, these folks that we saw in, this, in spent are preyed upon. Um, if you know, the, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau gets a lot of grief um, from, um, from banks. Banks, you know, I don't like regulation, but regulation sets the rules of the road. And if we had proper regulation in place, then we would not have experienced the recession and economic crisis uh, that we did. And so one of the things that the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau has done on mortgage rules is inject this crazy notion that it actually has to be, before you make a loan, you have to determine that the borrower has the ability to repay it. The ability to repay requirement, that's kind of, you know, it seemed basic to us, but that's not in place for payday loans. And so rules, rules that require that the borrower has to be able to repay, that the lender uh, ensures that the borrower is able to repay the loan, and that there's a limit on the number of payday loans that someone can have outstanding at one time. There should be no industry that depends on abusive practices to be profitable. Uh, if, if we can uh, make um, financial services available to um, low-income people, our mortgages, 90% of our mortgages last year went to first-time home buyers. Uh, we had half, half, less than half a percent losses on those loans, even though our average borrower income is $40,000 a year. And so we know how to make loans. It's a little more labor intensive, but if we can scale that up and do it in a uh, sustainable way, then certainly B of A, Chase, Wells Fargo can figure it out. So I just have one Please. thing to it. Um, I think um, we can't depend on our government to solve this problem. Uh, Many of you have probably noticed that things don't get done quickly in Washington, um, and it's very difficult to move things through. Honestly, the private sector has the resources, uh, assets to push against this. And I actually think now for companies, and this is why at American Express we are so involved in this, is we have the obligation to utilize those assets to help partner with um, people like Bill, nonprofits, academia, to actually imagine solutions going forward. This is not going to be any one company doing this or any organization doing this. So I think um, the reason that we wanted to uh, have spent, um, you know, go out into the population was to start this dialogue to start this partnering that can come together because, again, I firmly believe there's a solution in here somewhere, but it's gonna take a lot of partnering to get it done. Thanks. Uh, let's start, um, oh, well, the mic is there, so we'll start where the mic is. Thank you, uh, Dan and Bill, for what you're doing and changing the financial system. Obviously needed, Dan, you alone have changed my opinion of American Express. Mine just too. tonight. Thank you. <laughs> However, I was, I was surprised by Derek, your comment in opening about how we are a progressive nation. I can't remember if you said tax structure or something to that effect. And I'm curious what the panel thinks about what Robert Reich will more, more than likely say tomorrow morning about the declining uh, middle class and the increasing disparity of income and how our country was built on um, a prosperous middle class. And I think why we're seeing some of these banking problems are not, is partly the financial system, but partly it's our system that is not supporting a prosperous middle class. 
What are your thoughts? You know, it's certainly not strictly a solution around the financial system. Uh, there, there, and there's a lot of debate uh, underway about minimum wage, about and, and certainly the wages is um, is a is a critical part of it. But I, I also think that assets, um, building assets, is a is an important piece of the puzzle. If you have assets, then you have a safety net that can allow you to weather some of the storms that we saw represented in the in, in the film. And so I think it's. It's a matter of getting wages up to where they are reasonable. Uh, one in four, you know, they, these problems affect everyone, but they disproportionately affect communities of color. Um, one of four um, women in Mississippi with a bachelor's degree uh, doesn't um, earn enough to make ends meet. That's the same as a uneducated white male. And so there's disparities that exist. Uh, that need to be addressed in wages and, and in wealth. And so I think policies uh, can help to attack that. But I think, um, uh, again, I, I think Dan made a good point. Um, this, uh, I really appreciate what uh, American Express is doing. Um, the, this is a matter of leadership. Um, if all financial institutions took the approach that American Express is taking about investing in these communities in a more serious and sincere way, uh, rather than just doing enough to meet the regulatory check the box, then I, just, I think we'd see, um, we'd see a, a far, far, different, um, far different results in low-income communities. Just add one quick thing to that. I think um, there's so many issues in our country uh, that we need to think about and address. Um, so what you want to make sure is that it, these things don't conflate, and, and all of a sudden you get into such a huge issue: education, you know, minimum wage, income. All, and what I really want to focus on is like, what is a solvable issue right now? And this underserved community being excluded from the traditional financial services uh, community can be served in a much more efficient, productive way for them. And we can return a tremendous amount of money to them as a result of that. And that starts to address other issues. And so what I've really been trying to do is keep some of these issues separate because they tend to want to go into a, a number of different social ills that we, that we face as a country. But I really think that as a financial system, we can do a much better job of servicing the entire segment of the population, not servicing sort of the wealthy. It's ironic, right, that the, that the less money you have, the more it costs you to manage and move it. That's pretty ironic. It should be probably the other way around. And, but we should be able to go do that with technology. And that's kind of, and if we can do that, we can start to maybe make a difference in, in, the, in the new middle class. I do have to say, I think, I think Dan's more, I don't know if he's smarter than I am, but he's certainly more disciplined than I am. Uh, I, I think these problems have to be attacked in a comprehensive way. Um, we, uh, access to capital, we talked about consumer credit here, but mortgage credit, we are financing uh, community health centers, healthcare, um, we're in the most, I, I live in the most medically underserved region of the country. Uh, these, these institutions, also don't have access to credit because they are so dependent on public payments and banks don't want to take the time to underwrite those credits even though the revenue stream has been consistent for for decades and so whether it's access to health care we're financing charter schools uh, in new orleans and low-income communities uh, we're providing tools that help when a uh, student at some community colleges get their financial aid uh, and they pay their tuition, they get cash back and if, they don't, if they don't have a checking account. And so they get it on a stored value card. Every transaction, depositing funds, um, reloading those funds, uh, extracting funds out of their account, comes with a fee. And so we're working with community colleges to make, um, to get those um, students bank so that they don't have to spend their limited resources uh, on fees and, and on what, what uh, amount to predatory fees. So um, we, I think there are contra, um, comprehensive solutions, comprehensive approaches uh, that deal with education, with healthcare, with many of the ills 
uh, that face these communities. I, I, I agree. We, um, we cannot solve them all, but we can partner with groups who uh, have core competence in those other areas. Last thing I say really quickly, just to clarify the opening comments, is that right, if you look at sort of just the federal income tax code, the money you make between zero and 10,000 is always, from wages is always taxed less than the money you make over $300,000. And so we have progress, progressivity in the tax code. What struck me as so stark in the story is how perfectly opposite it is with bankability. That, ha that even though it's more expensive to make over $300,000 vis-a-vis the IRS, it's cheaper to have over $300,000 vis-a-vis the banking system. And that struck me as being just so out of cord with the values that are just so clearly embedded in, in the American law. But thank you for, for prompting the clarification. Um, we have one more question here. It's actually not a question. So commentary, um, I was just going to say from my perspective um, and realizing that the Federal Reserve was established in 1913 and now it is the 101st anniversary, that it comes to no surprise to me at all where our country is um, and where our government has actually left our country. And I do entirely believe that the answer is within the private sector. Because if the government was going to help us, you know, they would have done it by now. Um, and <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, I think part of the solution might be only, you know, we're... Clearly there's um, gridlock with bureaucracy and maybe only paying congressmen when they're in session and getting stuff done and demanding um, that they do something and maybe putting people in those positions and not allowing them 98% of the time to get reelected if you really want change to happen um, and maybe implementing some of the new generation into those policies um, where like the generation actually being affected by student loan debt. And um, I saw this movie, it's called In Time and it's, um, about where people's exchange, their currency is their time. And it's really kind of a satirical tone to it. Um, but we, we're there. Like, our currency is time. You know, like, you, you're poor? Well, that sucks. You're going to be working till the day you die. Like, um, so I don't know. I just thought uh, that was an interesting view that, um, you know, 101 years later, here we are um, wondering why our students are on borrowed credit when our country started on borrowed credit. Thanks. I don't know if you guys want to respond to that, but. I think she said it all. Yeah. She said it all. Good. <laughs> all right. Um, we have one question over there. Uh, it seems like we have no problems shifting large amounts of money with lightning speed, you know, whether we're talking about transferring it from one count, account to another or, or one country to another or one state to another, you know, regardless of what that measure is. Uh, in, in your exploration, and I really applaud your effort for kind of taking a day to walk in, in, in these folks' shoes. Uh, at what point is, you know, mitigating risk, uh, masking in this archaic system, uh, racism, classism, you know, assumptions, uh, profiling, uh, uh, certainly being a person of color, uh, having a last name like Mendoza, I feel at a disadvantage even in the position that I am of, of having an income, uh, being able to support myself, my families, and, and even having a little bit disposal for those investments uh, in, in any fashion when you walk into these institutions. So at what point does the rubber hit the road on this archaic system, and, and are we only scratching the surface by trying to develop these collaborations when, when we really have to get at the heart of the culture behind the system as well? Well, I can talk uh, on the technology side of it. Um, the truth of the matter is it should never take as long as it uh, does right now. So when uh, uh, you do international remittances, and that often happens where people send money from this country to uh, family uh, uh, in other countries, that, can, that process of moving that money um, can take days, right? So you have to send it to a bricks and mortar location, somebody has to come pick up the cash, et cetera. Honestly, that really is bits moving from one, ser one part of a server to another part of a server right now. Um, and so I think, I honestly believe that technology is going to redefine a lot of the processes that uh, uh, today plague us in terms of not having immediate access uh, to cash. And as you saw in the film, that immediate access to cash is a critical component for many families that um, research has shown, it's interesting, that for, for many families, not all families, but many families, 
This isn't a matter of expenses exceed revenues. It's a cash flow issue, that you've got expenses coming in now, but your revenues come in later, right? So, it, so that actually, and there's been great academic research uh, done on this, especially by NYU. Um, and so, you know, my feeling on this is, how do we create this ability to have buffer and the ability to move money faster uh, to more accurately uh, line up expenses with revenues uh, on this? Um, and I think technology is basically is blind to uh, somebody. It is basically trying to do the right thing through uh, data and information. We talked about credit. Data and information, you can now take somebody's cell phone calls that they make, right? Who they, how many people they call, when they call, where they call, and that information is correlated to credit worthiness. Whereas credit bureaus never look at that kind of data and information. And so I think technology is going to fundamentally recreate this system around us and hopefully address a lot of the issues that you brought up. All right, looks like the last one here. I believe the statistics on people that are in debt and then are helped to get out of debt are in excess of 80 or 90% that they go back into debt. It would be really interesting to see if that family who got people to pay off that debt go back into debt and end up right where they were. Is the problem really bigger than, is it managing expectations? living within your means, or is it a combination of all of these things? I was one of the founders of the debit card, and a dollar to send a very large payment is pretty cheap, but when the payment's only 10 bucks, it's 10%. Right. So technology is there and can do what you've said. We can do a payment for 10 cents. So if it's a small payment, it's a smaller amount, if it's a large payment, it's a larger amount, but it's still a small percentage. It can be done. American Express can do that as well. But you have tremendous overhead and people and print and infrastructure that have to change over time. And it requires a new app where they get their paycheck, a thousand of their 2,000 is paid directly to the app, and from that app, they can pay their bills at a much less expensive rate because it's, a new, it's no infrastructure, basically. It's software. And that app should be out there, and if it isn't, Amex could create that very, very easily. It's out there, and we have created it. I do think that a point that you make um, was actually addressed in the first panel that we had when one of the first questions that I asked was, is this a consumer debt problem? And there was an historian, uh, uh, Lewis Hyman from uh, Cornell University, and he said, it's not a consumer debt problem, it's a consumer jobs problem. And this goes to your point about, is this an issue that the banking system alone can fix? No, this is an issue that combines globalization of technology, opportunity of jobs, wages, the cost of living. How many times did we see healthcare costs drive people that thought that they had done everything right into bankruptcy? So as you said, there, there are a lot of things here from expectations to wages that also play a role. Um, I think the issue that we're talking about is, you know, how do we fix you know, our own little garden in, in, this, in this complicated picture. There's also financial education. We didn't talk about uh, that. All of our branches have staff who are trained to provide uh, financial education. It's, again, it's the old banking model where you sit down with someone and help them understand the decision, think through the decisions that we're making. And we, as, as you balance that high touch and high tech approach, you've got to think about how you do that. We're, we're, we're about to roll out an app that uh, uses um, uh, essentially bubble budgets, where every time someone makes an expenditure, a bubble, uh, either red, green, or yellow, uh, appears on their cell phone. And if the if it's red, then you're over budget. If you're if it's green, then you're in budget. The larger the bubble, the larger the line item, and it automatically populates that information for people. So, and it makes them think about their spending decisions without thinking 
about the spending mm -hmm. decision. So it's, 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 I think it's very intuitive for the population that we're trying to serve. And so I think the financial education, um, building financial capacity is an important piece of the puzzle. Financial wellness is crucial. I, I mean, it, um, to Bill's point, the great thing about software is, you know, how many of us have done a budget before? It's incredibly hard to do a budget, right? You have to write down every one of your expenses. You have to categorize it. But if you're moving and managing your money through a software platform, it automatically does it for you. And you can see, I spent $200 on entertainment. I don't want to spend $200 on entertainment. I want to spend $125. So send me a text alert when I'm approaching that so that you start to create financial education and wellness. And that money, I have a savings goal. So we're also in spentmovie.com. There's legislation in Congress right now, bipartisan, to promote what's called the American Savings Promotion Act, which many countries overseas use where they incent people through a lottery system to save more. But instead of putting your money at risk, it just, you, your savings is intact, it's never at risk, but the more you put in, the more chances you have to win more money into your savings. It's a great way of getting people involved in savings and uh, there are a lot of people on both sides of the aisle trying to push that ahead. And you can tie that into software and you, know, it, you can start to create wellness, financial wellness, not just avoidance of fees and, and, uh, and time savings, but really a way of thinking about your financial life in a holistic manner. All right, one more. One over here, one more. Just a short, sure. Short For the fact that savings is at risk through inflation. Savings what? Is savings at is at risk. Through savings inflation. is at risk through inflation. So, so the people who are you incentivizing saving isn't necessarily helping people. Savings is always a good thing to have. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, 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 mean, I have to I, disagree. Yeah. yeah. Realistically, inflation is a uh, is something we all deal with. But it's better to have savings than not have savings. Yeah. It, it, there, you, it's hard to argue that point, given that you need buffer, because we all have life shocks that occur. And it, once you don't have that buffer, you don't have savings or access to credit to cover that, that's when you go into the payday loans. And you know, payday loans, you know, we average 300% or more in terms of interest things. So I think trying to incent savings and create the wherewithal and the capability of people putting money into savings is, is the right thing for us all to, to try and go do. I agree. Great. Guys, thank you all very, very much. And thank you to the panelists. Thank you.